a lot of the reasons why we have poor concentration, a lot of the reasons why we get distracted is actually because we choose to be distracted in life. In life, we have two options in every moment. We have the option to pay attention or we have the option to be distracted. These are our options that we have. Either I pay attention to what's in front of me or I don't pay attention to what's in front of me. Yeah, which means I choose to get distracted. Now, the reason why a lot of us have chosen to be distracted is because we have now associated a positive term with distraction. And that term is called multitasking. Mm -hmm. We have associated multitasking with distraction and therefore we feel it is actually beneficial to be distracted. Why? Under the guise of multitasking. We feel that, yes, I can now afford to be distracted, which means I can now choose not to pay attention. We explored last week that the desire to multitask is coming largely from the belief that it is more efficient. It's a belief. It's actually a false belief. But there is a belief that by multitasking, doing many things at once, I can complete many things at once. And therefore, I can live more efficiently and save time. Psychologists have made it clear that even from a, a thought flow point of view, and from a psychology point of view, this is a misnomer or a misunderstanding. The notion that there is more efficiency with multitasking is in fact false. In fact, efficiency and productivity go down when people try to multitask. But now we have connected all these things together. So we've connected to distraction, to multitasking, and multitasking to efficiency. And because of this, we buy in. We choose not to pay attention. And every time we choose not to pay attention, we choose not to focus. We choose not to concentrate. Yeah. And as we allow this choice to continue, whatever you continue to choose to do eventually becomes habit. Mm -hmm. So we end up creating this habit. And this habit we create is a habit of not paying attention, a habit of being distracted. Mm -hmm. And as this habit goes on, we find this is the nature of my mind. My mind now struggles to pay attention. That when I need to pay attention, I find it hard. When I need to focus, I find it difficult. And I can only do it for a very short period of time. Therefore, a lot of it comes down to changing the way huh, we view multitasking so that we come to recognize multitasking is a form of uh, distraction. All of us want to be focused. I don't think that's something you really need uh, to encourage people. You don't need to inspire people to be focused. Everyone does want to be focused. Everyone does want to be more uh, concentrated. But uh, it's because we buy in a lot to multitasking that we end up giving or sacrificing this quality of our mind. So now... Last week, we looked at how can we practice concentration in our day-to-day -day activities. And there we just discussed huh, that when you pay attention to things, when you choose to focus, when you choose to concentrate on things, then what happens is you develop mastery over that thing. Hmm? Anything you give your full attention to, you gain the maximum out of. Yeah? So you become a master of that thing. And this is what we have to shift our focus towards. I choose to pay attention because by paying attention, I become a master in this field. And when I talk about mastery, 
please don't understand it just from the standpoint of skill, talent, and career. But what we need a lot of mastery in is actually the field of relationships. In the world of relationships, we have very, well, I would say we have a decreasing, declining emotional intelligence. Our capacity to understand and empathize with other people is what we are sacrificing. This is what we are giving up each time we choose to multitask, is actually we are giving up and sacrificing meaningful connections with people, deep connections with people. And as we give up deep connections with people, you give up meaningful relationships. We sacrifice meaningful relationships. So a lot of the times, obviously in our house, very common discussion is that we're all so busy running from here to there to the next place that I don't have time to pay attention to exactly what, what my children want or what they're saying and they need to get things done quickly. And same thing goes with my partner. I don't just get the job done. Let's not have a big discussion about it. Come on. Yeah. But one person wants to connect. One person wants to be heard. One person wants to share. And the other person is not available. Mm -hmm. And as you practice this over time, then obviously there's a big cost in that relationship. That the cost is that finally we feel disconnected. Even though we're surrounded by people, we feel very disconnected. Yeah. Now's a beautiful time when we're in lockdown to actually practice. And I'm sure you've all got more time now to actually practice being focused, being attentive yeah, to those around you. And you might find that there all of a sudden becomes a shift and change in the nature of that relationship. So last week we talked about paying attention and paying attention means doing things. We talked about mastery, sorry. And mastery means doing things with love, care and attention. Whenever you do something with love, care and attention, you are becoming a master of that. I was watching a documentary on Bill Gates. Somebody recommended it to me. It's very interesting. Bill Gates, one of the most powerful minds of our century. I think you all know who he is, founder of Microsoft. And the start of it just talks about his amazing intellectual capacity. And it just talks about his capacity to read. He loves reading. And he can read volumes of books in short periods of time and still have tremendous amount of retention. They talked about 150 pages an hour. And he doesn't read common things. He's not reading Mills and Boone's romantic novels. Yeah, he's reading like quantum mechanics and he's reading management theories and he's reading oh, data analytics. Really dry stuff, but he reads. And not only can he read so fast, but his retention rate is close to like 90%. They talked to one of his colleagues and they said when he reads, he's retaining everything. His brain is basically like a, a supercomputer. And he's had that since childhood, actually. And having it from childhood really would, from our point of view as a Hindu, we would say that's a samskara that actually he has got from his previous birth. That's something that he worked on in his last birth. That he's practiced concentration. He's practiced uh, attention. He, he's, he's abstained from distraction. And he's practiced it so well that even when he comes into this birth, he already has that capacity. And we know that. We meet people and we find they're just very focused people. You can't distract them. They can lock themselves in a corner and they can just, they can just completely hone in on the task that needs to be done. We've all met people like that. We all know children that are like that. And when a child is like that, it's almost inexplicable. How can you explain that one child is like that, the other one child is a bit more distracted? That's because it's been practiced in previous birth. And this brings back to one of the other 
benefits of practicing concentration. When you practice concentration, one of the things that you will get out of it is increased or faster comprehension. Hmm? You get faster comprehension of any ideas, of any thoughts that take place. With that comprehension, you also get better retention. With, constant, with increased concentration, you find you have better memory power. So if people want to improve their memory, one of the key elements is to practice concentration. And then obviously, from faster comprehension or greater comprehension to greater retention, you obviously then get greater absorption. But that knowledge sticks with you. Yeah? And you're able to implement. It's easy to implement. And this is why people sometimes find that why of Vedanta, how do you practice Vedanta? How do you practice Vedanta? Is that last point we get stuck on. How do you implement? That implementation is not clear. And part of that is distraction of the mind. If you free yourself of such distractions, you will find implementation becomes quite straightforward. It's quite simple as to what you need to do. Yeah? So these are the benefits of concentration that when I choose, it's something I have to choose every moment. I have to choose to pay attention. Yeah? And the beauty of it is you can choose it with anything. Any action and anything you do, you can choose to pay attention. Yeah? Whether it's washing dishes, whether it's eating, whether it's speaking, whether it's cleaning, actually sometimes the most mundane tasks become the easier ones to focus on. And that's why we said practice it with mastery, which means start doing these things with love, care, and attention. Okay. Now just in terms of other methods to build up concentration, then of course, we said paying attention, but also what, we, what is called nowadays is mindfulness. Mindfulness is very helpful. Yeah? And in mindfulness, one of the keys in mindfulness um, is to allow your senses to be saturated with what they are perceiving. That's actually the focus in mindfulness. That whatever you're seeing, perceiving through eyes, ears, nose, mouth, tongue, skin. Yeah? Whatever you are perceiving. Perception takes level. Perception takes place at the level of senses to sense object. So it is eyes that are seeing. It is ears that are hearing. It is tongue that is tasting. Skin that is touching and knows that is smelling. This is called the jnana indriyas, organs of perception. And in mindfulness, what we're trying to do is saturate them. We're trying to saturate them, allow them to take up maximum amount of information and data through the senses. We're not trying to curtail them. Hmm? And so when you practice mindfulness, it's really the practice of mindfulness is to actually free yourself from thoughts that are not in the present. Thoughts that go into the past and thoughts that wander into the future. Thoughts that wander into the future and become negative are called anxiety. Thoughts that come, go into the past and become negative are called regrets. So when you practice mindfulness, it's a method of actually controlling your mind. That's the point. You're trying to control your mind, which means don't allow thoughts to roam into the future or the past. Keep them entirely here. How do you keep your entire thought process in the present moment? Saturate your senses with the present moment. Yeah? Yeah? And when you saturate your senses with the present moment, it doesn't mean you need sensory overload. It means you just need to pay full attention to what your senses are actually absorbing. 
So if you're looking out into the garden, pay attention to all the flowers. Pay attention huh, to the colors. Pay attention to the way the breeze moves branches. The direction of the wind. If you're out there in nature, the coolness of the breeze. The fragrance of the breeze. Hmm? Actually, it's so interesting when you read descriptions in the scriptures, especially in the Puranas, whenever they want to describe an, a scenery, they give so much description. It's so vivid that even towards the breeze, they have got different adjectives which are given. Huh? Suganda, Manda, Anukula, Samir. Huh? What does that mean? A breeze which was fragrant, Manda means soft, a gentle, fragrant breeze, an anukula, very pleasant. That's just for describing the breeze. Many of us wouldn't even know how to describe it. It's windy, that's it. It's cold, that's it, finished. I don't have any more adjectives. So a lot of the time we don't know how to describe things because we haven't paid enough attention to all the different nuances that exist. Mm -hmm. Even in uh, what you wear, the texture of your cloth. There's texture, there's warmth, there's comfort, there's color. All these exist just in the cloth that you wear every morning. So it's about becoming, having heightened awareness. Having heightened awareness of your sensory perception. Hmm? As you have this heightened awareness of sensory perception, the senses are so flooded with information that the mind just has to focus on that. It can't wander into the future and it can't wander into the past. But when you're not paying attention to the senses and what's happening in the present moment, that's when the mind starts wandering. And that's when it starts playing games. So the easiest way to keep that mind from wandering is actually just absorb yourself in what is in front of you. Allow the senses to drink in every iota huh, of information that is available. This world is amazing. This, abs this jagat is absolutely amazing because it is filled with so many different sensations and stimulations. And if we just allow ourselves to pay a full attention to these things, you will realize there are worlds in front of you which you have never seen <laughs> it's so fascinating that even though we all live in the same house many times we all experience the same things but how we experience them is so different that you will find that one person who's used to being in the kitchen when they come into a house, that's what they see straight away. They see the kitchen, they see the food, they see the cleanliness of the bench, they see if things are left out, they say this food needs to be put in. Somebody left the milk out, can't believe they left the milk out. This is where their attention goes there. Huh? Some people's attention, TV, family room. Huh? And they're looking, who's taking the blanket? Where's my favorite cushion? Huh? Why is this chair dirty? Where's the TV remote? That's sometimes the biggest question is only that. Where's the TV remote? Their attention goes there. Others are in the office. And in the office, they're wondering, do I have the Wi-Fi? Do I have iPad? Do I have iPhone? Do I have a computer? Do I have all these things? Do I have all my files with me? Now, when you find that every time you enter into your house, a very interesting exercise would be, see where your attention goes. Every time you enter into your house, where does your attention go? Because wherever your attention goes, that's where your habit is. That's where your preoccupation is. That's where your fascination is. And what we want to be able to do is enter into any environment. And in any environment, rather than being dragged away by a particular object, can I absorb every object and every space that's there? So when I enter into my foyer, can I absorb and take in all the elements just of that foyer? Yeah? Whether it's the initial ambience of entering into the house, whether it's the color of the tiles, huh? whether it's the fragrance when you enter into the house, the house will have its own fragrance, whether it's the warmth, the change in temperature from outside to inside. Yeah? 
whether it's the view, whether it's the decorations, can you see all those things? This is called being more neutral. You start developing neutrality. Neutrality means your senses are not habituated towards running towards a particular object. And as you start practicing this neutrality, then what happens is you can start enjoying and becoming intoxicated with any situation, with any environment. Any environment becomes fascinating. You don't need a TV to capture your attention. You don't need a phone to keep you interested. Because merely the entrance of your house itself, there's so many things to be fascinated with. Then when you move into another room, whatever room you're in, can you become fascinated with that room? Can you become fascinated with that space? Yeah? And so three things they talk about, sight, sound, and smell. Hmm? They're the three things that we should really become very attentive to in any space we enter. Sight. Sight means color also. Obviously cleanliness, the place of where things are, where have things been put? Are they in their own given space, their right place? Mm -hmm. Then you've got things like color. Some people are very aware of color and the impact that color also plays on our mind. Color does play impact on our mind. Don't think it doesn't. Every color creates a subtle emotion within us. That's why you'll find whenever, it's universal, whenever they want to show alert and danger, what color is always used? They always use red. Everyone uses red. Danger, red. Yeah? Because you got things like fire was red, but blood was red. Blood is red. Because blood is red also, whenever we see blood, it's danger. Something is not right. Yeah? And so certain colors, hmm, they are, they universally connect us to certain emotions. White, cleanliness, but sterile. Black and white is very sterile type environment. It's also a bit cold. It doesn't have a warmth to it. If you want a, gen, if you want a gentle warmth you want to add to a room, yellow. Yellow does that. Yellow adds warmth. Coolness, purple, blues. Each color has got its own impact. And we all know, nature, whenever you want to show anything in nature, green. That's why whenever a company wants to show that they're nature friendly, they'll always have a green logo or do something in green. Something will be there in green. Because we all associate green. Green is associated with nature, environment. Yeah? And so in this way, even when you enter into a room from a sight point of view, are you able just to take in all the colors? And are you able to wear what impact the colors have upon you? That's why even what colors people wear also have impact. Mm -hmm. Why do people love, you know why other cultures love Bollywood movies? Why they love Indian culture so much? Because every five minutes in a Bollywood movie, Everyone starts wearing the most multicolored, hyper-colored, hyper-tech outfits and dancing around in madness. And people love that. That's why the West is also completely fascinated with it. Whereas many cultures in all their formal ceremonies, black and white. So black and white means very serious. Mm -hmm. It's very solemn. Yeah. Color all of a sudden brings about fun, life, enjoyment. Yeah? So, when you enter into a room, are you able to even pick up the impact that color has? That's called sight. Mm -hmm. Sound. That in any environment you go into, also the sounds that play a part. Mm -hmm. Some people always have something running in the background. 
They love having some, something going in the background. You must be aware of that. As you become more aware of the sounds that are going on, are they pleasant or unpleasant? We also know the nature of music and the nature of sound has got different impact. There's soothing music, there's soothing sounds, and there's very disruptive sounds. There's sounds that are tamasic, make you dull. There are sounds that are rajasic, get you very excited. And then there are sounds which are sattvic, which bring you into a peaceful mood. Some people like waterfalls. They find that waterfalls and the falling of water makes their mind feel at calm, at ease. Mm -hmm. But very rajasic music gets you very excited. Sometimes that's good when you have to go for a run and do exercise. Then you need something rajasic. Now check the sound that is in each room, in each space. Are you aware of the sound that's there? Because if you come from a very quiet place and you go to somebody's house and there's always noise going on, you will find that, wow, there's a lot of activity here. There's a lot of things taking place. People that are habituated to it, they don't know. They don't recognize it. Because for them, it's just default. That's just how, that's how life is for them. Yeah? But when you go from one environment to another one, you become very aware. Yeah? of sound. The other one is smell. Smell is another factor. That when we enter into different environments, different smells trigger different. That's why people like going to the pantry cupboard in the kitchen because a lot of nice smells coming out of it. Yeah? Food. Mm -hmm. But if you've ever been to like hospitals and all that, they've always got that very strong uh, disinfectant smell. And it's, it's always quite repulsive actually. So you always, you don't like that. Yeah? So that smell of disinfectant, all that, it's a very sterile type of environment. Then there's smells that are very, huh? You, you feel, uh, you want to eat, they trigger off hunger. And then there are just smells that are very pleasant, you know, fragrances, lavender, all these things. People put fragrances in their house, yeah? So the, the capacity to even just see this, sight, sound and smell in any situation, and we're not judging them. We are here just trying to pay attention to them. That in your own house, have you paid attention to all these different factors? Mm -hmm. In this practice of mindfulness, you're actually developing concentration. You are developing concentration. Yeah? So, that's another aspect of concentration. There are other very practical things that people can do. Uh, memorizing things. Practicing memorizing things. That also builds concentration. Yeah. Uh, and that's why, you know, in our tradition, we used to just take shlokas and we recite them again and again and again and again. You know, and still many of you also do that. Yeah, that we recite shlokas again. It's also a form of improving memory. And when you improve memory, you're improving and enhancing concentration. Okay? As you do these things, build concentration, build memory. The other thing you start developing, as concentration develops, willpower develops. And that's important. That one of the biggest gains you get from a more focused mind is willpower. You have the power to direct your attention towards any given object for any period of time. Okay? So willpower, the capacity to direct your attention to any given object for any given period of time. Object or thought. Now, there's something interesting that happens when you do this. Now, here it comes down to how our mind works. Our mind is a flow of thoughts. Hmm? If you imagine our mind like a river, a river is a flow of water. Our mind is a flow of thoughts. Now, a river can have various, you know, because of rivers have got different tributaries other rivers that enter into it. It can have different currents. And that one flow of water can have many different currents that are going through. There can be an undercurrent. There can be white water on top. Huh? There can be some part of the river that's hitting the bank. There's another part of the river that's pushing away and created another channel. And when you have such a river 
where the currents are going in all different directions, it's very unpredictable. You jump into that river, you never know where you'll end up. You can end up smashed against the rock, smashed against the banks, drowned or pulled underneath, huh? or just pushed out to the front. You never know where you're going to end up. But if we take that river and all of a sudden we just pour one current and one direction of water, there's only one flow of water that is going through that river, you will find that everything just goes into one direction. And as it goes into one direction, the channel of that river actually becomes deeper. It starts carving its way through the earth because the entire force of all the water is in the same direction. It becomes very powerful. It's channelized now. Mm -hmm. And when it becomes channelized, there is a power which it gains, which is not there when the water's all not flowing in the same direction. Yeah. So you start developing a secret power. And that's what they use. That's why we dam rivers. When we dam rivers, we then focus the entire volume of water into one channel and we use it to drive turbines and that's how you get hydroelectricity, hydroelectric power. Mm -hmm. So it's all by utilizing a secret power that is already there in the river. The river already has latent power. You have to harness it. Same way, your mind has got latent power. It has got a tremendous force in it right now. But for you to access and harness that power, you have to direct your mind in one direction. Mm -hmm. You have to get your mind to focus on one thing. And when the mind is scattered on many different things, you're not accessing that power. It's there, but you're not accessing, you're not harnessing it. You're not harnessing it. And so as we come to direct our mind and develop more concentration, this latent power becomes manifest. Hmm? This is the power of concentration. And in concentration, when you when you concentrate your mind and direct all your thoughts to one object, what happens is this power of concentration all of a sudden becomes a power of revelation. Things get revealed to you. You get a particular insight about that object. Revelation means you're able to gain deeper knowledge which your senses actually can't access. You're able to understand the object beyond sensory perception. This is called the revelation. And we've seen this. We have seen... We know that all great inventors and scientists, they have revelations. And why do they have revelations? Is because they're able to concentrate their mind. When Newton sat under an apple tree and it fell on his head, and to him, he was plunged into the thought of why do all objects fall down? And then he revealed gravity. Now that's in the Western world. Gravity was actually known much earlier even in the Eastern sciences. But if you look from our Eastern point of view, our rishis are called our scientists. And our rishis were people of tremendous concentration. They did a thing called tapas. And tapas means concentrating your mind. The same as this, this thing here, samadhanam. And... When they practiced tapas and when they, when they channelized their mind or directed their focused mind on a particular object of inquiry, all of a sudden they had revelation about that object. It could be about the universe, the world outside, secrets of nature, laws of nature become revealed. 
But what's more important is when you learn to direct that mind towards yourself. When you take such a powerfully concentrated mind and you direct it towards yourself, you will reveal many things about yourself. Many wonderful things will get revealed. And so this really becomes the hidden and the greatest benefit of practicing concentration is that you start accessing knowledge of things which are beyond your senses. And if only we rely on the senses, we are confined to a very small world. Now, I'll give you an example. This isn't a very a simple family uh, transactional situation. When you talk to people, whenever you talk to people, rarely do people ever speak their mind. Rarely do people honestly share their feelings. We all have a mask. We all have a filter. So when people ask me, how was the food? When someone asks me, huh, how do I look? We all put the filter down. And that filter goes on because it says, I don't want to upset this person. I don't want to jeopardize my relationship with this person. Yeah? I don't want this person to think any less of me. I don't want this person to be displeased with me. There are so many reasons why the filter comes down. Yeah? And so what happens is, when we're speaking to people, we have to do something. And it's called read between the lines. You've all heard this phrase. Read between the lines. That means what they said literally is not really what is going on. Something else is going on. They're saying one thing, but there's something else that's cooking. In all human relationships, this is there. All human relationships. There is no human relationship that has 100% transparency. Because all of us in any relationship invariably keep this filter. This filter is part of the ego. It's a protective mechanism for their ego. Now what happens is, when you have very poor concentration, you end up living at the level of the senses. Where what you hear is what you end up settling with. Oh, this person said they liked it, so that's why I said we'll do it again next week. Yeah? So I scheduled it in next week because they said they liked it, or they said they liked Avengers number one, so I booked us for Avengers number two. Well, I thought you like it. Yeah? And then what happens is you book Avengers number two movie to go watch. And they say, what? And then you see all of a sudden their mood. It's not as exciting as it was last week. Last week the mood was so good. Now why the mood is a bit less? And then you find Avengers number three, mood is going down. Avengers number four, it's terrible now. Now they're yelling at you. Why do you keep booking these films? I never get to choose what we do. You choose all the movies. You only take these. You only do that. I never get to see what I want to see. And all of a sudden you're flabbergasted. What on earth just happened? You told me last week that you enjoyed it. Therefore, I went and booked all the other ones. <laughs> I was saying that just to keep you happy. I didn't really enjoy it. It was just because I thought you were happy. And, okay, well, rather than upset this whole Sunday afternoon or Saturday night, I did okay, we'll go see it. But I actually didn't like it. I didn't like it. But I was just saying it to keep you happy. I'm getting tired of looking at your long face. So I thought you also need a win. So okay, we'll go watch Avengers. So when a person, many times when people say they like something, there's so many filters going on, we can't actually understand it. We have no intuitive knowledge. And the reason why we don't have this intuitive knowledge is because we lack concentration. <coughs> As you get greater concentration, you're able to pay attention to every subtle detail that is taking place in that conversation. You can go beyond the world of sensory stimuli, which is just their words, and you start seeing body language. You start actually 
feeling the mood. And some people are there, they can feel the mood of the room. You know what they say, the mood of the room? The walls don't have a mood. What that means is the people in that room are giving off a certain vibration. This is an emotional vibration. It can be emotional, it can be intellectual. It's coming from your subtle body. The subtle body means the mind and intellect. Our mind and intellect is giving off a vibration. And we can actually detect that vibration when you have this power of concentration. With the power of concentration, you can detect that vibration. Sometimes when you ask people to do something and they'll say yes, but you're never quite sure if they're going to do it or not. But if you have this power of concentration, you pick up on the vibration. They're saying yes, but they're not going to do it. They're agreeing to help, but they're going to flake. They're not going to make it. Why are they agreeing to help? The people say, why did he agree to help? Because six other people in the room said they will come and do gardening seva at the ashram. He being the seventh could not look like the odd person out. Therefore, he said, I'll also come. After twisting other people's arms, the other six said yes. So the seventh chap has to say yes. Or oh, you're not interested in helping? Huh? Be a team player. What type of person are you? Don't give back. No seva. Ayo. So when you get the seventh chap, you should know that from the seventh yes that you got, his mood was not there. His vibration was off. There was hesitation, reluctance. He was the last person to enthusiastically get involved. You should be able to pick up. It's unlikely this person's going to come. Hmm? It's unlikely they're going to participate. It doesn't look like they're interested in this. Yeah? It doesn't look like that person actually agrees with me. Hmm? This is really important, especially in the family. And especially when you occupy a position of authority. When you occupy a position of authority, it's very hard to figure out what the people below you actually think. Because part of it is that they don't want to lose favor with the person in authority. So young kids don't want to displease parents. And even teenagers can be very nervous huh, about upsetting authority because authority has the ability to actually put restrictions on you. Authority has the capacity to say, you're not going to use your phone. You're not going to go meet your friends. You're not going to eat this food. You're not going to go to this birthday party. Authority has power over this person. And so when there's an authority figure which has power over you, there is obviously a lot of filters that are used. There can be fake agreeability. There can be false conformity to ideas, to belief patterns. And we only realize this when finally the authority figure is removed. And when they become free of authority, then you will find that actually they actually start speaking, living and following their own feelings and beliefs. And at some, if you're very disconnected from that, that would be very shocking for you. You'll find that I can't believe they've taken up this lifestyle because you never saw it. And how come, how come you didn't see it? And how come you didn't hear it? It's not because they didn't say it. It's because there was no faculty of intuition. So with low faculty of intuition, I was not able to read between the lines. I didn't recognize that my children were terrified of me and therefore they just agreed to everything I said. Meanwhile, they were developing a plan on how to move to the next state to get educated <laughs> because they just wanted to get away from living with me. But it's always called educational opportunities. Opportunities is the buzzword that everyone uses. Dad, I have job opportunity. Where? Iceland. Why Iceland? It's the only place I can find on the face of this earth that is far away from you. And it's, it's a good distance from you as well. So therefore, I have taken up Icelandic opportunities. Yeah, I'm going to learn to develop technology in Iceland. See if they can get better Wi-Fi. 
All this is because actually <laughs> I want to avoid huh, dealing with this person in front of me. We do it all the time. We do it with bosses. We do it with colleagues. We do it with friends. And of course, we do it with family. And that's why one of the greatest benefits we get from concentration is this hidden power of revelation or intuition. Okay? So through this hidden power, you can harness it. You can ha- It's already there in your mind. It's there. It's dormant. Water already has the power to drive the turbine. You just need to direct it. If you direct the water into the turbine, it will drive the turbine and generate electricity. Same way, if you direct your mind into one flow, one point of focus, all of a sudden this intuition or revelation will take place. It takes place about many things, okay? It's the same thing. Now when you turn it upon yourself in self-discovery, it's absolutely fascinating. Many times in our own mind, we find that we have blocks, that we have certain behaviors and habits which we ourselves don't know why we do. Sometimes we can't even see them. Other people have to see them for us. Other people note that, do you know you have a habit of doing this? You have a habit of saying this. Mm -hmm. And sometimes we can't recognize that habit. Others recognize it for us. And then when it's recognized, sometimes we don't know what its origin is, what its cause is, and then we don't know how to resolve it or change it. So when you take this power of concentration, this power of now intuition, and you turn it upon yourself, it becomes amazing. It becomes an amazing tool for self-discovery and transformation. And what happens is you are able to catch your own habits and behaviors before they end up having negative impacts on the world around you. Otherwise, our current method is that we act in a certain way until it annoys enough people. And when it finally annoys enough people, they, they all have a bit of a civil riot going on outside. And after this civil riot, then there was a protest. And with that protest, we realized, okay, I need to change my ways now. I can't talk like this anymore. I'm very abrupt. I'm very abrasive. Some people only talk to other people when they want something done. They don't ask, how are you? They don't ask. They're not interested in how your day was. Has this been done? Has that been done? Yeah. And so people feel a bit cold. You don't really seem to care. Yeah. And so when we are able to catch these things, when we are able to discover these things before others do, it just means we cause less friction with the world. It also means, another thing is when you understand the world with greater intuition, it also means you are less surprised and shocked by what happens in this world. Because you already have an intuitive feeling about a certain person's behavior, about their method of thinking, like I said, their agreeability, compliance, that when they revolt, or when that person has a very wildly different opinion, you kind of anticipated, you knew this was gonna happen. This faculty of intuition coming from concentration, great leaders have this. Anyone who has to deal with people at very high level, they're very good at what they do, they will have this capacity. It's almost like reading someone's mind. It's not really, but people like to think it's mind reading. It's not really. But that's what they have. Hmm? This secret fact. So all this is coming out of huh? power of concentration, okay? So... We talked about simple techniques, mindfulness, saturating your senses, sight, sound, and smell, and being neutral. Just saturating them, being aware of all of them. We talked about uh, practicing memory, 
developing memory by repetition, practice of memorizing things. Yeah. And of course, what I've just discussed today uh, with regards to intuition and seeing that which is beyond the senses, one of the most, e the easiest and most effective methods of developing concentration is called attentive listening or active listening. And in active listening, you give your full 100% to the person who's speaking. And rather than just capturing words, we should be trying to capture import. Not just the words of their sentences, but the implied meaning. What did they really mean? Read between the lines. You should try to catch up tone. You should try to catch mood, intention, all these things. When you can start recognizing these things, that's a very high level of attentive listening. If you can capture the person's intention as to why they're speaking, their mood, their emotion that is predominantly there, there's, there's like I said, there's the masked emotion and there's the real emotion. The masked emotion will be pleasantries, agreeabilities, non-conflict, uh, but underneath that, there can be a lot of suppressed emotions. If you can recognize that, that's a high level of attentive listening. And then import of their sentence. What really do they mean when they're speaking? Because, you know, nowadays, well, I don't want to say nowadays, but maybe it's always been there. But a lot of times there are a lot of poor communicators out there. Actually, very few people are good communicators. Because as we lose vocabulary and as we lose insight, we actually don't know how to communicate exactly how we feel. And that's why I think a few weeks ago we talked about the emotional wheel. Yeah, and that's what that emotional wheel is really important because it helps develop uh, vocabulary. And as you develop vocabulary, it's easier to communicate exactly how you feel. There's less filters. And when there's less filters, the listener also understands you clearly. Okay. So all this is what we can gain through the practice of concentration. I've given you various practices there. So with that, that becomes the topic of samadhanam. That's one of the qualities of a highly receptive student is the capacity to focus and concentrate. 